Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In the last of our podcasts on the impact of the war on society and family life, we hear from Professor Susan Grazel about women at war. My name is Susan Grazel, and I'm a professor of history at Utah State University. I'm a historian of the cultural history of war and how modern war shapes gender relations. The title of my talk is Women at War, Gender, Place, and Experience, because I wanted to think about how much the authentic war story is restricted to one gender, men, usually one place, the Western Front, and one experience, which is that of combat. We're very familiar with the stories of women in the shipyards, in the forestry corps, in the munitions factory, as nurses and physicians, the grief they're experiencing as widows, as mothers who have lost children. But there's also an experience of striving to survive this war given its enormous dislocations to the economy, to society, the mobilization of populations of men and what women then take on. There's an enormous expansion of regulation and the state into almost every aspect of daily life. The British homeland becomes a target of attacks in ways that were unthinkable before 1915. So I really want to take seriously the idea that the experience of women in their homes is a form of participating in war. In the first week of July of 1917, Britain unveiled with great fanfare its first national baby week, coinciding with some of the most devastating air raids that London had experienced. One of the places that was hit by this aerial attack was an infant school in Poplar. There were a number of attempts in the aftermath to try to make sense of that juxtaposition of celebrating the things that could be done to help the family at the same time that families and indeed small children were being killed. One of the witnesses to this attack was a British suffragist named Ida O'Malley, who was also a writer for The Common Cause, which was the main suffragist newspaper. The week after these events, she wrote an editorial that powerfully sums up how much things had changed. In her words, for perhaps the strangest thing about these times is the extraordinary way in which things which used to be separate in fact or in our minds have been violently thrown together and, as it were, mixed up. In former days, it used to be possible to arrange things in categories. One could still, if one wished, think of the state as separate from the home, of men as separate from women. Now it is much less possible to do so. One of the things that's very striking about the British case is that alone of the great powers, Britain had to raise a volunteer army and needed to mobilize millions of men. One of the ways that it sought to do so was by translating the complicated reasons for the war into a very positive message about defending home and domesticity and values that every British man should hold dear. It did so through images of women of all ages, from older women saying, go, it's your duty, lad, to a young mother with a child by her side on behalf of the women of England saying, go. In the case of Ireland, there were separate posters where an Irish woman was brandishing a rifle and asking, will you go or must I? As it became apparent that homes were being overrun in Belgium and northern France and in the Eastern Front as well, there was a very powerful poster produced contrasting a bit of England and a bit of Belgium 
and it begins with the comparison of their homes. The secure British homes are flooded with bright colors and sunlight and a village of neat thatch cottages. The elderly walk unmolested down a lane and children and mothers are at play and fear no harm. Whereas in Belgium, which is shrouded in dark colors, smoke is rising from ruins, unfurling into the sky, and it's one of devastation. And the poster tells us explicitly that their women are murdered and worse. There are dead children. The implication is that it could happen in Britain if men don't come to the defense of this idyllic home life. Because the home is being mobilized, one of the concerns was about the families of servicemen. Were they going to be provided for? How would they withstand the loss of income? The British government had a policy of separation allowances, which were meant to reassure men that their dependents would be just fine. The problem with separation allowances is that the system relied on a volunteer workforce because they don't have the staff. The system cannot keep up with demand in the first year and, in some cases, the first two years of the war. So there is enormous economic distress. In a place like Glasgow, you have a number of mothers and wives of servicemen and also of war workers who can no longer afford to keep up with their rents. They mobilize themselves, mothers with babies in arms, taking to the streets, saying we cannot pay our rent in what becomes known as the Glasgow rent strike, which forces the government to take action and introduce legislation that's going to have rent control. So that's one example of how an economic grievance thrust ordinary women into a political role that demands action. The introduction of lethal chemical warfare happens on the Western Front in the Second Battle of Ypres on the 22nd of April, 1915. It's unprecedented, so there is no equipment to deal with its effects. The War Office issues an appeal, circulates a pattern in the Daily Mail, and calls upon our women to make respirators for our boys at the front. It instructs the women to find cotton gauze, cotton wool, and thin elastic, and transform these ordinary household materials into a defense against what will become some of the most feared weapons of this war the women respond. So the appeal goes out, and within 24 hours, there's been, in the words of the Dundee Courier, a deluge of respirators. Sewing groups have created thousands and thousands. The Royal Army Ordnance Depot in Pimlico is inundated, and the War Office rescinds the request within 48 hours. There are lamentations from Ireland that the Irish women had not had sufficient time to demonstrate that they too could contribute to this. This small anecdote is an amazing instance of domestic skills and domestic products being repurposed to support military efforts. When these masks are delivered to the front, they end up being almost completely useless for a variety of reasons. We quickly have versions that will get us to the gas mask as we come to know it in the First World War. But those gas masks are also going to be made by women in factories, women who might have been in the textile industry beforehand, now turning those skills to the manufacturing of soldiers' uniforms and soldiers' gas masks. The story of food in this war is something that touches every nation and truly every family. The British government is mobilizing, again, through propaganda, posters that say the kitchen is the key to victory and food will help us win the war, which means learning to do without sugar or without certain foodstuffs. 
the food supply and access to the food supply and the fairness of the food supply also become a tremendous concern. There's a wonderful painting by C.R.W. Nevinson, one of the great war artists, the original title for which is Squalor, and then it becomes relabeled The Food Cue, that uses the same dark and gray palette that he uses for his paintings of the more traditional battle zones to depict very weary looking civilians, particularly women, waiting online for food. The ubiquity of the food queue and the potential of the food queue to turn into the food riot as it did in Vienna and Berlin was a very real fear. One of the sources that we can use to understand what life in Britain was like during the First World War are memoirs. And one of the most powerful ones that I've come across is Sylvia Pankhurst's The Home Front, A Mirror to Life in England During the First World War, which she published in the early 30s, but reflects her experiences living and working in the East End of London from 1914 till 1916. Pankhurst is a very interesting figure, probably less well-known than her mother and sister. She splits with them over the war and decides that her mission during the war is to alleviate the suffering of the working families that she sees in the East End of London. She helps organize the transformation of a pub into the mother's arms as a day nursery and a center for these mothers and children, and comes to see and articulate quite clearly that the real enemy for women during the war is war itself. Sylvia Pankhurst describes her own experience of air raids. She makes no judgments of those who live through them, whether they riot in a panic or whether they are stoic or whether they are fearful. She saves her scorn for what she calls the air raid tourists. In her words, those, quote, well-dressed people in motors, journalists, photographers, high military officials who come to the East End to see the devastation wrought by last night's air raid. Annie Purbrook, the mother of five living in Essex, describes air raids in her diaries as follows. Glorious moonlight nights will ever be associated in my mind with these terrible experiences. No sooner has the moon fairly risen than our ears are disturbed by the sounds of bombs or guns. Tonight it seems to be all round, gunfire, shell fire, little spurts of flame, searchlights, bombs dropping, shells screeching. It is devilish, damnable but language is altogether inadequate to express the wickedness of it all. What's so powerful about that passage, it's, it's a combination of sights and sounds that are reminiscent of battle. They're in fact the sounds of a battle being waged at home, one that has made, as she concludes this passage, one place as safe as another for all one can know. As the war came to an end in 1918, one of the most visible signs of women's political life being recognized is their partial enfranchisement in the Representation of the People Act. But this was suffrage on terms that the women's movement would never have accepted in 1913 when they wanted the vote on equal terms with men. The title of a book that appears in 1918 as a guide for the wife, mother, and voter sums up the ways in which this franchise is about women's domestic roles as much as it is about the war work. One thing that I hope people will learn from the 100th anniversary and the attention being paid to women and the First World War is there is so much more we need to learn about the experiences of women at war. But one of the things we do know, and I think we can say with confidence, is that women helped win the war one home at a time. <laughs> <laughs> 
That was Professor Susan Grazel on Women at War. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next set of podcasts, we hear about how the war was experienced in Scotland, in Dundee, Wales and Ireland. <laughs>